Perfect. So great, for our second talk, we have uh, Calvin Chen from uh, Imperial, who's gonna be talking about consistency conditions from causality. Well, that was the title in the email, it's slightly different here, but <laughs> it all works out, I think. So please go ahead, Calvin. Uh, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, yeah, sorry, I sort of decided to change the title a little bit. Um, it's not a very um, not a very um, telling title, but I'm hoping to get some um, of my uh, points across anyways. Um, so this is based on work I did with uh, my supervisors, uh, Claudia Doram and Andrew Tolley, and a collaborator, A.B. Magalit, in these two papers. Um, and roughly what I want to talk about is how we can find causality conditions or consistency conditions uh, from causality on uh, low energy effective field theories of gravity. So this is um, why uh, I'm here. <laughs> so let me just motivate briefly um, the background. So I think we can all agree that GR is a reasonably effective theory. So we've tested it to reasonable precision, but we also know that um, above a certain cutoff, um, which I'm just going to call lambda here, um, but really the cutoff is above lambda, probably, um, we expect a different uh, theory. We expect some UV completion to complete gravity because GI is not very well behaved at high energies. So we might expect these to be um, the corrections described by string theory. Um, at energies much below, or sort of much below the Planck scale, what we expect is a partial UV completion so where we have GR plus some light fields plus some heavy fields. If, um, so this is a this is a pun. This is a, a tower of massive higher spins. It's really a massive tower of higher spins. But anyways, um, <laughs> so below that scale, below lambda. So once we have integrated that all of the um, massive states, what we're going to be left over with is some low energy theory with just GR, some minimally coupled, coupled light fields and derivative interactions with just which just involve the uh, light fields so the question then is essentially what we can put what constraints we can put on this um, eft so what i call lir essentially so if you go back to the 80s um people would have told you that um there's essentially nothing you can put on that so once you flow from the uv um because rg flow washes all the information out um, there should be no information uh, left over at the IR. So really it's the entire sort of landscape of possible effective field theories that should be consistent with UV theories. But we now sort of have a more modern take on this. We now, uh, know from the Swampland and um, the S matrix on positivity bounds that there are actually non-trivial constraints which are retained once you flow to the IR. Um, so one of these, um, is um, causality. So this has been studied since, I mean, it really causality as an idea and field theory goes back to the 50s. Um, and there are some interesting sort of properties about this. So as an IR, so the IR avatar, so you want the what's happening in the pink region here um, can be seen quite easily. So let's take an example. Let's take a Goldstone boson on flat space. So the effective theory for that has just some kinetic term and the leading order interaction is this d phi to the four term. So if you pick known UV completions, so where the phi is some um, transfers a fluctuation in a, of a brain embedded in a higher dimension, um, the sine G corresponds to um, a causality in the, in, the, in the high dimensional picture. If you just took like uh, two different scalar fields and, um, and integrated one of them out, um, G would be the one of the, the 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 coupling squared of that theory. So somehow you always find that G has to be positive um, if you want this to be uh, sort of sensible, coming from a sensible UV completion. Um, and this doesn't seem to be a coincidence. So the IR avatar of what I was just uh, saying is that if you look at propagation speeds of this theory around a uh, background in which you spontaneously broke Lorentz invariants, um, this, the propagation speed of those um, perturbations goes like one minus G. So somehow if G was negative, um, this would give you superluminal propagation speeds. Um, what Adams et al pointed out is that this is consistent with what we know from um, 
you can derive this essentially just as a using analyticity of scattering amplitude. So this is would be the UV avatar. So this is if you if you insist that your theory is causal even up to the IR, uh, sorry, even even at um, high energies, um, you find this very similar bound. So those are arg arguments more based on amplitudes or um, if you want the S matrix program. So all of this is very subtle when you have dynamical gravity. So on the side of the positivity bounds, I don't know if you can see my pointer, um, but on the side of the positivity bounds, there's like technical um, challenges there. And on the side of the lumin uh, super, uh, well, propagation speeds, it's also a little bit subtle, um, essentially because light cones aren't well-defined. So I should, I want to talk about that a bit more just to set the scene. Um, but essentially what I want to do is um, make it, make this notion of how we can use causality at low energies um, to identify consistent EFTs, which contain gravity uh, more precise. And yeah, any questions at this point? By the way, you can stop me at any point if you have any questions. Um, all right, so let me just speak a bit more about causality in general. So um, if you have causality in a theory with dynamical gravity, um, defining just the this like propagation speed is slightly more difficult just because you can use field redefinitions on the metric to change the uh, light cone structure. So this is slightly more subtle. But generally what you can do is to define something called the time delay on an asymptotically flat um, space with a killing vector. Um, because then um, the, the, you can define this time delay quantity um, in terms of the S matrix or the phase shift. And this is going to be um, field redefinition invariant. So roughly this tells you the difference between propagating through a, a empty space without any interactions relative to um, with some interaction in the middle. And typically you would say that in order for this interaction, whatever it happens in the middle to be causal, if you want delta T to be positive, otherwise it means sort of integrated over the trajectory at some point you must have gone faster than the speed of light. But this is a well-defined quantity. You can define it in terms of the S matrix. You can um, find it in terms of field theory at low energies as well, where everything should be well-defined. So um, yes, so there's two sl small subtleties. So this expression for the time delay, which is just the derivative of this phase shift with respect to the energy, um, it's only um, valid up to the resolution scale at which you're at. So if you have some energy scale E that you trust your theory up to, uh, sorry, that your theory is that you're doing your scattering experiment at, then um, the corrections to that expressions are going to be uh, coming in at one over E, which is the minimum sort of time scale your um, scattering can probe. So really, whenever you make any statements about delta T, um, if the, the magnitude of delta T is smaller than one over E, um, it's not a meaningful statement you can make. So this is just, uh, I guess, rephrasing of the uncertainty principle. The other thing is that when you consider uh, the time delay of a theory with an EFT correction, you can always um, separate the EFT correction from the GR, uh, GR contribution just by the um, you know, equivalence principle. And it's really the EFT correction that sets, well, that, well it's the GR uh, contribution that sets the reference for causality. So any EFT correction that is uh, to the time delay that is negative, um, essentially it poses some uh, form of causality violation because you can have um, high energy particles which only see the GR contribution decaying at, uh, to particles with low and uh, at low energies. Um, they can go faster than the GR reference at low energies and then recombine. And it's sort of, this is the sort of asymmetry. It doesn't work the other way around. So it's really the, the sign of the EFT correction that matters when you want to know whether something violates causality or not with respect to the GR background. Um, so together, um, you want to conclude that you have a causality violation um, if and only if both the EFT contribution is negative and the contribution is larger than one over E. So you can, you know, you can make that into a bound, which is a small violation of um, positivity. Um, is that clear up to this point? Let me know if you have questions. Um, so one thing you might want to do is to try this on uh, an example. So 
the sort of best testing that we have for this is to just scatter them off black holes. Um, and we did this in the previous paper about uh, spheric, in spherical symmetry. So you just do it about a Schwarzschild black hole and doing the decomposition is all a bit complicated, but once you get to the end, you find that um, it's essentially consistent with positivity bounds. So I'm gonna say a bit more about that, but really what I'm gonna talk about in this talk is um, an analogous situation where you um, take the Eichelborg sexual boost of a black hole. So you just end up with a shock wave localized. So it corresponds to some localized source. Um, and it's a, it's a type of PP wave. Um, the, the benefit of this is that you get the same result as for the individual uh, black hole, but you can make a much more interesting configurations out of this. So in particular, so if you think of a small thought example, um, if you start out with a single uh, contribution where delta EFT is negative, you could imagine that you can find some um, configuration of shock waves such that your overall time delay is enhanced by some factor alpha. Um, and as alpha goes to infinity or as a, it becomes really large, um, it essentially, you can make this bound such that um, it forces whatever uh, Wilson coefficient you have to be zero. So in, in practice, what you can do by finding more complicated um, configurations by stacking small amounts of a causality is to get rid of this resolvability criterion. So another way to think about it is if a single shock wave or a single scattering event doesn't give you enough causality violation to give you a strong bound on your um, on your EFT because of this resolvability criterion, um, this uncertainty principle criterion, um, you can use shock waves. In principle, you can use shock waves to get around it. So you can get much stronger bounds in principle by doing this. Um, and this is what I want to emphasize in this talk um, is not possible. Um, so essentially, these, these are the type of configurations. So starting from a shockwave, you can try to scatter off many shockwaves, or you can scatter between shockwaves. So the more precise goal I have in mind is to use these more complicated configurations to constrain um, EFT operators using infrared causality. Um, so to do that, I'm first going to talk about quickly about um, just PP wave backgrounds in general and defining EFTs on them and how wave gravitational wave prop propagation would work. So just as a reminder, uh, in Brinkman coordinates, um, the, the metric looks like this. So it has some, it's, I've, I've chosen null coordinates in the, um, yeah, I've chosen null coordinates. Um, the convenient thing about them is that the only non-vanishing component of the Riemann tensor is this, so where you have two U's. Uh, and vacuum Einstein's equations then just impose that this F has to be a harmonic function. And once you've done this, um, essentially everything you can write down um, all the possible contractions you can write down with um, zero indices or two indices have to vanish. So you can think of doing some lots of contractions with Riemann tensors, lots of contractions with covariant derivatives, everything has to vanish. So um, at the level of the background, if you give me an arbitrary action with high derivative corrections, with, um, with EFT corrections, the background equations are all going to be satisfied at leading order in the EFT. Sorry, sorry, at all orders in the EFT, just by virtue of um, the PP wave background being, well, the, the equations of motion vanishing on the PP wave background. Um, so in, in, in the past, people have said that this means that really PP waves are exact solutions in, in string theory. Um, one slightly underappreciated thing is that if you look at equations of motions of perturbations on top of PP wave backgrounds, um, the perturbation equations generically don't vanish. This is sort of a very obvious statement, but th there's a priori no reason why these should vanish. So th that means that for those, at least, the EFT corrections are non-zero. So if you want to look at your equations, if you want to write down your perturbation equations, um, you need to make sure that your theory is under control. So you do that by bounding, so writing down all possible operators and asking for them to be bounded, um, weighted pro appropriately by, by, the, um, by the cutoff. So at the level of the background, there's no, um, there's no bounds in principle, 
But because of you can because of particle propagation or because of perturbations, you can actually find some non-trivial bounds on both the background and the um, and the perturbations um, using sort of bounds that are schematically uh, looking like this. So in particular, there's one bound here that looks quite funny. So this is this one, which involved f, and f is the profile function in for generic PP waves. So the problem with that is that it means that if we look at shock waves, which are the singular, which have the singular profile, um, um, yeah, which have yeah, they're singular. Um, they actually violate these uh, effective EFT bounds. In particular, if you just plug the singular profile in, it very obviously violates the bounds unless your cutoff is diverges. So what you need to do is actually uh, regulate your shock wave as a Gaussian. So you can write down something like uh, like this, um, where the Gaussian has some width L, and then the EFT validity re uh, regime of validity bound just tells you that L is bounded from below. And this is precisely the reason why you couldn't, uh, weren't allowed to take L to be zero in the first place to get a delta function. So then you can try to find um, some interesting statements about this. So at leading order um, for PV waves, um, the EFT of gravity in greater than five dimensions, four dimensions, is just Einstein Gaussian A gravity, just because at, yeah, this is not topological in five and higher dimensions. And all the other corrections are higher order in the EFT uh, expansion. So you can then look at the perturbation equations, um, which look like some uh, wave equation. And you can decompose them to look like really just some second order partial differential equation. There's nothing sort of very fancy about this. Um, so let us try to solve this. Um, so if I just take a Fourier um, um, transform, this just becomes a Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation can be solved very easily. I uh, plug in some WKB ansatz and solve a uh, treat uh, the Laplacian perturbatively. So what I want to do is uh, make sure that this expansion is well defined. So I ask my um, subleading terms to be really subleading. And because they all grow in time, it means that there's a particular time, so in so the one of the null times, um, at which my approximation just breaks down. So when I then do my calculation, I should make sure that the calculation is really that when I um, when I compute my um, time delay, which is sort of integrated over a trajectory, I really put in a late time cutoff um, up to this time u where it then doesn't work. So if you just look at the expression you can derive from the EFT contribution, um, you find that because the, the perturbations from the from the gas Bernay term come in two different uh, come with two different signs, means that in principle, if you didn't care about the resolution, um, the minimum size of the time delay effect, you could engineer a situation, you could you could find um, causality violation because for whatever sign you have of C gas Bernay, there's always um, a positive and a negative sign. So there's always some mode in the metric decomposition of your uh, gravitational waves that could in principle violate causality. Um, so the resolution to this sort of paradox is the following. Um, if you're very careful about your maximum scattering time up to which your um, uh, up to which your calculation for the time delay is valid, and you're careful about the EFT regime of validity, which put this um, cut off on, well, put a lower bound on your um, how well your source is localized, you find that the magnitude of this EFT contribution is actually bounded from above. And it's bounded such that when the Wilson coefficient of your um, theory is of order one or less, it's actually not resolvable. So um, causality is restored in this way. Um, and this is for any localized source in, uh, in, in time. So localized in space, but it could be an, an arbitrary profile in time. So in particular, this includes the sort of slightly famous example of having um, lots of shocks in in um, spread out over time and sort of scattering of them. And 
you can think about this in a particular way by so yeah you can, yeah you can think about this in a particular way so if you take your shock to be um, n well separated um, individual shocks the individual shocks have to have some uh, minimum separation and they also have a width so that means that the separation should be greater than bigger than the width in order for them to be well separated um otherwise this approximation that the time delay for n shocks is just enhanced by um, by a factor of n doesn't work so in principle in order to get your maximum causality violation and your best sort of bounds on Wilson coefficients you want n to be as large as possible um, but you see that n is really determined by how much um, you can consider your scattering for um, divided by how many shocks you have so it's u max divided by delta u and u max is bounded from above and delta u is bounded from below um, and therefore uh, you cannot make an arbitrarily large so this is the sort of um, this is the sort of intuitive reason for why this doesn't work um, there's the classical way to understand this but um, maybe I shouldn't go through this just in the interest of time um, but the punchline is that this is essentially due to scattering so if you if you imagine scattering of a black hole for example the the approximation uh, of neglecting the Laplacian is essentially just saying that you should be going in a straight line past the black hole. So if scattering becomes not uh, not negligible, you should be careful about the calculation and this is when it breaks down. And there's similarly scattering is essentially in the, because it's the Schrodinger equation, it's essentially um, just diffusion. And you can understand this in terms of an S matrix picture as well um, in order to make a statement about the time, uh, about the phase shift. So another thing you could do is to um, avoid scattering of the sources by scattering between two uh, between two sources and that are transversely displaced. So if you travel between them just by s um, by by z two symmetry, you shouldn't be um, you shouldn't scatter any any direction. And you, in principle, Im could imagine that. Um, you can accumulate a, a, a large enough time delay to get very sort of much stronger bounds on your Wilson coefficients. So what doesn't work here is essentially that this configuration is unstable. So once you treat the Schrodinger equation in um, beyond the semi-classical or the Born approximation, you find that there's an instability time scale. So the instability time scale can be seen as following. So if you just take the if you just take the classical equation. It's, it's very simple to see that um, the solutions, the WKB solutions um, are some exponentials, complex exponentials, um, but omega squared is negative for these unstable, along these unstable directions. So there's some instability time scale. So once again, when you look at the, how much um, um, time delay, EFT contribution to the time delay you can accumulate over the maximum time that your a calculation is valid for, um, you find the same bound as before, and as long as the Wilson coefficient is bounded by one, um, it's consistent with it, well, then it's consistent with infrared causality because the magnitude of the time delay is uh, too small to be resolvable. I know this uh, this calculation is slightly tedious, but well, yeah, but it's so we did it in a few different approximations to see uh, how valid how well that works. Um, so let me just get to my conclusion. So I've, I've hopefully shown you that however you try to engineer different configurations of black holes or shock waves, um, however many you have and how sort of contrived your um, configuration of them is, you always find in this leading order uh, EFT in greater than four dimensions that the EFT contribution to the time delay is bounded by um, the, the absolute value of the Wilson coefficient over KV, which acts as the energy. So this is the essentially the minimum time 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 scale that you can measure. So one perspective is that infrared causality just imposes that this um, Wilson coefficient has to be less uh, than one or order one. Um, and this would be consistent with bootstrap and positivity bounds. So here's a, a plot from, um, from the authors here. Um, where I think, so C gas Bernay corresponds to alpha two. So if you pick a particular value for alpha four, um, the bound just corresponds to a slice through here. So this roughly, I mean, 
it's roughly order one, unless <laughs> they're bounded by order one numbers. Um, the nice thing is that you can understand this as a mild violation of positivity bounds, um, because you get, when you have dynamical gravity, you have um, this resolute resolution, um, resolvability criterion. And this is essentially why um, positivity bounds or weak gravity um, conjecture type bounds uh, have to be violated like this. Um, the other perspective is that you could simply say that in order for this to be a well-defined EFT, um, weakly coupled with some weakly coupled partial UV completion, um, it's natural that the Wilson coefficient is order one or less, in which case you can just say that gauss bonnet gravity or gauss bonnet gravity thought as an uh, effective field theory just pure, just doesn't violate infrared causality. So yeah, that's it. Um, in conclusion, just to uh, remind you, so I I'm hoping I've made the case that in curved space time, the really correct notion to learn about effective field theories is infrared causality. And when you make any statements about this, um, about your uh, low energy effective theories using causality, you should be very careful about identifying the regime of validity of your EFT and the approximations you've used in calculating your scattering and your in computing the quantities in your scattering. Um, then I use the example of einstein gauss bonnet gravity as an effective theory um, to say that this uh, that infrared causality is consistent with uh, known bounds, um, uh, yeah, bounds that we we know we already know, and the resolvability criterion gives us a very nice complementary understanding why um, there has to be a mild violation of positivity bounds. Um, and possible future directions are that that you can use these on. So in principle, if you use as many different backgrounds as you can um, with progressively less symmetries, you should be able to sort of carve out the, the all the possible bounds you can get on different EFT operators. Um, and in particular, because infrared causality is a very lo local notion, is a slightly more local notion of causality at least, um, it should be possible to, for example, um, extend this to the theta and possibly also get more bounds there. So I think that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and let me know if you have any questions. All right, let's thanks uh, Calvin for this uh, this great talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Alvaro, please go ahead. Okay, yeah, thanks for the, for the very nice talk. Uh, I mean, I, I missed a bit, like, before you introduced, like, the several uh, waves, like, before that, can you please clarify again what's the case and the approximation that you're making for when, when the constraint actually makes sense on how you recover the causality, the causality for the order one uh, parameter? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, here on the yeah, next slide, sorry. basically. I, I just so, missed the... the, the yeah, the, sorry. The, the, so it's the, essentially... case and the approximation. So it's essentially you take your so you you um you take your your effective action with for example in this case a gr well einstein Hilbert plus gauss bonnet you look at the perturbation mm -hmm. equations around a pp weight background um you find an effective schrodinger like equation so you have some first order time derivative with some laplacian and an effective potential effective potential has both a gr part and this is the mm -hmm. eft correction so you can you solve this by using a WKB ansatz. So you get some exponential like this, and you expand perturbatively. So you you treat the Laplacian in this equation perturbatively. So you get delta zero is the equation when you don't have uh, Laplacian at all, and then you plug you plug this back in with the delta right, one okay. and solve this with the Laplacian. So the yeah the regime of validity, so to say, for this calculation is that you want Delta zero to be um, always larger than delta one. Otherwise, you you don't you the calculate the well the approximation is not under control. And and, and the time scale in which this grows and, and how how is that fixed? Yeah, so essentially, the perturbation well, grows. Um, you can well you it, it's not fixed. It, you just get it from the solution, and you just see that they grow with time. So. Delta one is initially smaller than delta zero, but they grow with time and they're sort of okay. a crossover point at which delta one is, is larger. All right, all right, all right. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, maybe I can ask a quick uh, naive one. Uh, at the beginning, you said um, you could translate this causality in terms of like time delay for like asymptotically flat spaces. Um, 
so so what would you do and in, in when you don't have that when we have like ads or something or is there like some version of this that would work or yeah so so the idea so g generically let me just go back to the slide um so generically the problem is that you well so we we did it on asymptotically flat spaces and i mean people have done it um have been looking at this before just because it's you can use the s matrix and everything is nice and um field redefinition invariant but right. in principle because we don't because we only care about the infrared so the eft part it's essentially the contribution you find in a local inertial frame on a curved background so okay. really it doesn't care about the asymptotics at all right um, and there's some nice results by for example rachel rosen who did try to find a similar sort of notion of causality on the sitter. Um, and it seems like the infrared bounds uh, agree with that. They, they seem to be um, consistent with that. So somehow that the, it's just that the local contribution matters and that it doesn't really matter. We don't, it doesn't, the notion itself doesn't really care about the asymptotics. It's only convenient for computations, essentially. That's it. All right, that's great. I, I was about to ask you about uh, this being uh, more local in it, IR causality being more local and what you said about the sitter space towards the end. So, so that's great. Uh, that clarifies everything. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, if not, then I'll just, uh, we can thank everybody, all of the, the speakers again, one last time uh, for their talks. And then I'll stop the recording and we can keep the Zoom going for a while in case uh, there are any further questions.